So, we're pretty good friends at this point, right? I mean, I've managed to form a deep and personal connection with each and everybody who subscribes to my channel. Watch, I'll guess your favorite color, blue. If it's not blue, I don't know if we can be friends anymore. Besides the point, I wanna ask, how do you even start a video like this? Should I like talk about my experiences at Burger King? All the life-changing magical times I've spent at Burger King? Oh yeah, one time I walked into the women's bathroom at a Burger King when I was like five. I got lunch at a Burger King after a dentist appointment and threw up afterwards. My local Burger King has converted from an old train station after they moved it down the track to my college. Ooh, la di da. 30% of people have already clicked off the video. Fast food and video games have always gone hand in hand. Fast thrills and cheap eats, what a combo! Whether it's been video game themed toys handed out in kids meals or video games meant to promote a brand, you've got tons of examples. Spanning from Yo Noid on the NES, to the McDonaldlands game on the Genesis, to even the modern day with KFC making a game all about f***ing the chicken man. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry you had to hear me say that, but I'm just here to report the facts, not tiptoe around hard hitting topics. Well, nowadays it seems like the greasy chicken man whose very own mascot described their food as the worst fried chicken I've ever seen and unfit for my dogs rules the gaming space of fast food. A different king used to wear that paper crown. As in 2006, three games were released by Burger King of all people and ended up leaving an odd, oily stain on the paper bag of history. Pocket Bike Racer, Big Bumpin', and the infamous Sneak King. Today, we'll be looking at all three games because I was gonna make this a three-part, but trust me, that would have been a bad, bad idea. Before actually talking about the games themselves, it might be a good idea to talk about why and how these games were made, considering that assuming these came out like any other game would be confusing. See, the sordid saga of soggy fries and Xbox games began in an advertising award show at Kane's, where both Burger King and Microsoft were awarded for their works in the I Love Bees and Subservient Chicken ad campaigns. For those that don't know, it was a boomer ARG and slavery, but cool, respectively. The senior executives of both companies got to talking and decided, burgers? Xbox? Together at last? Burger King then decided it would get into the game making scene and wouldn't be so crass as to make their games blatant ads, but instead set them in the vivid and fleshed out BK universe. I hear that's where you go when you die if you sin. Soon after the call was put out to devs wanting to work on an Xbox Live Arcade games and soon Blitz Games was on the scene. That's right, Kids Choice Award winning Blitz Games. Soon after they learned that Burger King wasn't interested in making a game, but instead three games. The list of terrorist demands made by the company only grew from there, and instead of making Xbox Live Arcade games like they had signed up for, Burger King insisted on making them console games. Not just any console games though, as they would work on the shiny new Xbox 360 and the more commonly available Xbox One. <laughs> Burger King, for their part, wasn't letting developers flounder in regards to feedback or resources, bolstering the 15-person team to a massive 80 with their involvement. With Pocket Bike Racer and Big Bump, and it was a pretty easy process since it's a racing game and a bumper car game. How could you mess that up? But Sneaking had a litany of issues going for it through its development, which we'll tackle in detail when we get to that game. Regardless of the sub one year development cycle, the team managed to create three different games on two SKUs each, impressing everyone from Microsoft to Burger King to even themselves. As for how you were gonna sell a video game about racing as the Burger King, the answer was simple, give it away. For $3.99 in November to December of 2006, you could add a copy of any three of these games to your meal at Burger King. There are so many unbelievable things about these games' development cycles, like that someone could say the sentence, Uh, yeah, I'll have two Whoppers, a large fry, a copy of Pocket Bike Racer, and, uh, do you still have those, uh, chocolate milkshakes? To the fact that there were just a small stack of Xbox games in Burger Kings ready to be thrown into bags at the customer's demand, but... I'll be good and goddamned if it didn't work gangbusters. Collectively, the three games sold over 3 million copies, increased the revenue at Burger King by 40%, and ranked among the top selling games of 2006. You're not gonna wanna hear this next part, I mean it, but if you pull the three game sales together as one instead of three, the game as an Xbox 360 game is the 20th best selling Xbox game of all time, beating out the likes of every Guitar Hero, every Mass Effect, every Bioshock, Gears of War 3, every Assassin's Creed, and Red Dead Redemption. If you count it as an original Xbox game, it's the third best selling game in the console's history, only beaten by two little games called Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. I mean, we joke about these games being sold in value meals, but I don't think they can hear you over all the money they made. 
But eventually the promo came to an end and all that we're left with is the games themselves. So that begs the question, with all that background, did these games turn out to be any good? No. No, you knew that. That You knew that going into this video. Just because they were smart to give them away with burgers doesn't mean that they weren't giving them away with burgers. They knew exactly what they had, and what that was wasn't very good. But it's all about learning what measure of bad we're talking about here. Was it worth the $4 you would have spent on it back in 2006? Well, in order to figure that out, I had to get my hands on a couple copies of the games and I managed to get them off eBay for $8! These would have cost $12 if I bought them back in 2006, so yeah, I'm pretty frugal. Why yes, officer, I do have all the Burger King Xbox games. They even came packaged in the original cellophane and everything! Though, I did start to get a little suspicious when I gave the games the customary shake and I gave all my games. The Pocket Bike Racer 1 had the disc pop out of the spindle in the middle of shipping. So, we should probably be nice and play that one first. All the fun of pocket bike racing without the lower back pain! Lumbar support aside, I had to Google what the heck a pocket bike even was, and... Well, it's exactly what you'd think it would be. Literally a fourth scale motorcycle. It's essentially a cool version of those little trikes that clowns ride around on. The next biggest question is, who the heck is this lady on the cover? She's bigger than the king! This is Brooke Burke, American TV host, most famous for hosting Wild On, an e-travel show, and playing a reporter in an episode of Monk. Why is she in a Burger King racing game? <laughs> Why do you think I know? Oh yeah, let's go ask Jack what he thinks about this. I'm sure he's got the missing scoop. Let's just assume she was a fan of the Whopper or Fairly Odd Parent Shadow Showdown and move on. So when we boot it up, we get a trademark of all three games, a live action menu with the king. This is the easiest to digest out of three, with him just driving around a lovely green screen village. Of all the options, I sort of get tunnel vision and go towards create a character. Here I create Wambo, a subway sleeper agent who's out to destroy Burger King from the inside out by winning the race tournament. Sadly, he hasn't gotten a driver's license yet, so I don't like his chances. He's 6'3 and enjoys long walks on the corpses of his enemies, and also knitting. So I'll have to go play a race and we have the options to play online, play with your friends, or play alone. Guess which one I'm doing. Selecting a tournament, and we have the options for a standard race, a battle royale with cheese, the ultimate cone trial, and hardcore racing. I only eat plain cheese pizza, so we're getting the standard races first. We get to see the iconic cast of characters in our BK cinematic universe, including some woman-like creature claiming to be Rook Burke. I am so sorry they butchered her in the 3D transition. So Wambo saddles up for the first track, a Burger King parking lot. Someone named Tracy, who earns minimum wage, had to set up this whole thing because their company's mascot got a hair trigger and wanted to get into racing. So the race starts, and yeah, it's about what you'd expect from Ty and Mario Kart. You can accelerate, brake, reverse, all the fun of the fair, but the way it handles power-ups is actually pretty cool. Instead of item boxes, you have to earn power-ups by slaloming through traffic cones to fill up this bar. The more you fill the bar, the better weapons you can use. At the same time, you can burn a little bit of the meter in order to get a boost. It's a pretty cool risk versus reward for storing up for a better weapon later on, or reactionarily using a lower tier one, and you can still cycle down to lower tier items when you pass them in the bar. It's a system that I actually think is pretty much exclusive to this game, and I wouldn't mind seeing it in a different, better game. As for how the bike actually controls, turning could be a heck of a lot better as it feels really stiff. It just sort of snaps into place rather than turning naturally. As such, making turns and making sure the game works with you is harder than it needs to be. Then there's the drifting, which doesn't work how most drifts work in racing games. Instead of like Mario Kart or Sonic and Sega where your car drifts and you get a nice little boost the longer you hold it down, Drifting in Pocket Bike makes the car literally swerve in a different direction. You pivot on the back wheel as the entire bike just turns at once. It takes a long, long time to get used to it because it just doesn't feel natural in any way for a vehicle to turn like a Resident Evil character. Another thing is that while the power-up system is clever, it contains about five completely useless weapons and one crazy strong one. Missiles, landmines, shields, all well and good, but a fully charged bar nets you a disruptor, which is a controller switch. Left is right, right is left, it's the game's blue shell. The funny thing is that it can target anyone, even if you're losing, and it's not something that you get when you're in dead last like the item box. It's just something you can save up regardless of your position, and it makes it so first place can hammer the last place racer with disruptors. Or you can just keep it in your back pocket for when someone dares to be faster than you. Overall, the actual racing isn't 
bad. For a game that you might have gotten ketchup on when bringing it home, it's pretty decent. But that's all without talking about the tracks. All five of them! Seven month dev cycle, guys! Your favorite studio couldn't program a functioning walk cycle in that time. The first track, like I said, is a dirty Burger King parking lot. And since it's our first track, it takes it pretty easy on you. Gives you a few dips, ducks, and dives you gotta maneuver through to get boosts where you can. Those white ones give you an extra boost and are often in hard to reach places. There are even a few shortcuts which are well hidden. Overall, it's decent track design, now for something completely different! The next track is The Neighborhood, and is an immediate step down for a lot of reasons. First off is the fact that this is a deceptively long track. There's one later on that's even longer, but this one still has a lot of ground to cover in every lap. Second is the fact that this track is just covered in so many bits and bobs that you get snagged on all the time. You have to drive between these bits of broken fences constantly, and your bike is always getting caught on some bit of it. It kills all momentum, and with how hard it is to just back up and get back in the race, you'll be more frustrated than anything. These ramps throughout the level do give you some big air, and I thought I could cheat a bit by launching myself over this garden wall and skipping a big part of the track. I think it hurts sometimes. They even place one of these annoying little snags at the finish line so you get screwed over at the end of the race. So yeah, not a good track. The King's Garden is next, and it's a little better than the last one. It's an extremely windy track that takes a lot of twists and turns, but does have a pretty clever skip by launching yourself off this ramp. I'm taking this baby into turbo, let's go! Oh man, oh jeez, oh, God, I, uh, there's no handbrake on this thing. Uh, I, 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 I just gotta go, I, oh, oh, back in the race! I mean, with the drift, you're just gonna be crashing into stuff more than you're gonna be actually moving forward, so that's really cool, but overall, it's not a bad track. The construction site is next, and oh boy, when I said there was a mammoth of a track, this is what I meant. This track is so long, it only covers two laps instead of three. Piss off, Mount Wario! I got construction site now. This track is stuffed to burst with tricks and traps, ramps that punish you for boosting off of them, cones that cannot even be reached at certain CCs, Mortal Kombat X-Ray kills, it's all a little much, honestly. The track design can be way too open, which more often than not does not lead you in the right path and you end up getting lost on where exactly the track goes, save for a few markers that give you some path. It's probably the worst track in the game just because of how many places there are to fall off. Finally is Fantasy Ranch, the place that you see when you're getting your stomach pumped after eating the Nightmare Burger, which was a burger that they actually sold that was advertised to give you nightmares, and it worked! Can't make that up. This is an alright track for a racing game. It's got some high skill shortcuts, a few turns, that's your lot, go away. So now that we've seen all the tracks, what about these other modes? Well, Battle Royale is just a race that doesn't end until you score a certain number of hits on your opponent. Here is where you would actually use your lower tier weapons instead of just spamming big disruptors. Ultimate Cone Trial is just who can run through the most cones in the least amount of time, which oftentimes just ends up with you playing it like a regular race regardless of the amount of cones in one area. And the hardcore racing is just racing without items. You know how in wrestling when they have a hardcore match and they aren't allowed to kick or punch or attack the opponent and instead just sit there and wait for the harshest of winters to take them in the night? So that was Pocket Bike Racers, and it's the best of these three games, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it breaks much more than a below average. This game seriously lacks content, and I doubt you're gonna have friends who are either willing to come to your house for the sole purpose of playing Pocket Bike Racer, or also bought the game in their latest food run. Keep in mind though, it's all downhill from here. Big Bumpin' is next and carries on many proud traditions. It's a Burger King game, thank fucking God, and has our lovable friend the King moonlighting as a carnival attendee. This is a weird menu, cause watch the King, he goes through a few different motions while he waits for you to pick your option, and I expected it to loop after like a few seconds, but something odd happened. At first, the beast was pleased by my presence, beckoning me closer, attempting to create a mutual bond through our shared enjoyment of his wonderful deals. It was at this point I realized that by observing those who entered his restaurants, he'd learned the motion for laughter, yet didn't understand its context, throwing his arms back in enjoyment despite no joke being told. At this point, I was glad for the glass separating us. I was ready to call my study quits after he waved to me again, but I noticed that he didn't wave the same way as before. He attempted to go back to the well of his pantomimed laughter to put me at ease, but at this point I was anything but. By this point, the beast was impatient and tried to court me into one of his choices, seeming desperate for me to move on. 
the most frightening of my observations came next, as the beast tapped the glass separating us. Perhaps he'd been the one observing, and I was the beast in the cage. The fear was only confirmed as the beast waved to me. It was fully aware. It knew everything going on. And for a minute, it had become fragile, clutching its heart as it was decaying, though a quick thumbs up further added to the mystery. Then there was a hard reset and I knew the loop was over. They recorded a four minute clip of the king just staring at you for no reason. And I can only pity the poor fool that was trapped inside him to make this happen. So we get back to the character creator and make Wambo Jr. Ready to carry on the mighty lineage that his father started as a failed pocket bike racer. Wambo Jr. entered the vaunted halls of some amusement park to enter the Bump Off, a bumper car tournament that will undoubtedly give him fame and fortune beyond his wildest dreams. All he has to do is play a bumper car video game, and you know what? Fame and fortune are overrated anyway. I think I'll take Destitute and Forgotten within my most mundane daydreams. You know Bumper Balls, right? The Mario Party minigame? The one that goes on for way too long, never has a conclusive winner, and is the reason that every copy of Mario Party that has it comes with an apology, and about 40 other minigames to make up for it? Now imagine if those weren't there, and instead of Mario, you had the Grease God himself. Big Bumpin is absolutely the game with the least to talk about. Every mode is the same thing, just slightly changing what you need to do. We have five in general. Last Man Standing, Hockey, Own the Puck, Power Surge, and Shock Ball. Last Man Standing is obvious. Take your opponents out before they get you. Hockey is scoring goals on your opponent. Own the puck is keep away where you have to keep a ball and stop the other players from stealing it. Power Surge is a mini race where you have to go back and forth from a point, charge up, and then return back to the base for points. And Shock Ball is just tag where if you're it after a certain amount of time, you take a lot of damage. This takes place over a few different stages. And by that, I mean it's a different coat of paint because they're bumper car courses, not Dark Souls arenas. You got Hotland, Tentacletopia, can barely even make it onto the screen with the rest of the maps, the only map that will lead you to believe that this is a Burger King game, and the wet one. Each one of these modes is potentially fun once. Literally, a single playthrough and then all the fun is completely gone. It's kind of interesting how these games have a burn after playing command, because once you're done, you're done forever. The controls in this are so bad. When I compared it to bumper balls, I'm not kidding, it felt the exact same. You slide all around the place, turning his oddly hairpin for being in a bumper car, and you boost all around the place without rhyme or reason. You never really feel like you're in control of where you're going to end up, but the people who know exactly where you're gonna end up is the computer. They are deathly accurate with their attacks since they're only gonna be gunning for you. In Shock Ball, when the computer has a much more advantageous position to go after somebody else, they'll remember the time in high school where you said you thought Minecraft was for sissies and come for your blood. There is nothing worse than losing control in a game, and you don't have much control when everyone's throwing you around like a basketball. And for some reason, Brooke Burke is still in the game, but I guess they gave her the cover last time, so she doesn't even get a mention in this until the character selects screen. The game has a few different tournaments you can participate in, with each one netting you a different car when you win. Do the cars play any different from one another, including the ones that you need to work to unlock? Fuck you! Sorry if I have the least to say about this game, but there's the least game to talk about here. Luckily, the next game has more than enough to discuss to keep the interest going. Mascots are probably the most important part of a fast food place's success. Heavens no, it isn't the quality of the food. I mean, look at McDonald's! It's like every time I come here, it gets worse! But a snazzy marketing campaign could go a long way with establishing goodwill for a company. I mean, when you're competing against the McDLT commercial and Sexy Hamburglar, you gotta come out with guns blazing. And several companies have. Wendy's has been talking shit on Twitter for years, and even before that, Jack in the Box would outright dare other companies to fight them with rusty shivs on the corner of Park in Baltimore. One of my competitors says you can have it your way. Really? Good luck ordering breakfast after 11 a.m. Let's talk about my way. Yeah. My way means you can order anything on the menu, any time of day, whether it's a burger for breakfast or French toast sticks at midnight. Other places won't let you do that. And hey, if I'm saying something that's not true, do something about it. Burger King had sort of bounced back and forth on the whole having a mascot thing. They would have this little stylized version of the king from their old logos to the kids at your school that could say all the racial slurs they wanted in the Burger King Kids Club. To a chicken who had a website that let you tell him to kill a man by typing it in, Subservia Chicken was weird, man. However, it isn't called Burger Chicken, it was called Burger King, and in 2004, someone realized that maybe making the mascot a king would help get that message across. As such, they revived the old king mascot, but filled him with jungle juice until he looked like this. This is the Burger King you're most likely familiar with. 
giant grinning face, regal robes, and two real human hands to prove that this thing was made of organic matter. He was scary, he was unnerving, and he wanted to put hot food into your mouth and watch you swallow it. The ads they put him in were anything but watchable. He'd run the gambit of defiling R&B singer Mark Morrison's entire legacy by making Return of the Mac all about his loogie in the eye of God, the Mac and Cheeto. Having him be hit by a car in what I can only describe as catharsis, and talking about how badly he wanted to fuck Spongebob. Tell me he's trying to say something else here! I like square bucks and I cannot lie. Squid and sea star can't deny. When a sponge walks in four corners in his pants like he got phone book implants, the crowd shouts. All the ladies stare. Hang those pants are square. Swing into the seaweed tangles. Is a butt with sharp right angles. Now SpongeBob, I wanna get with ya. Cause you're making me rich ya. Burger King wants me to seal the deal. 99 cent, get a toy and a kid's meal. Booty. The commercials were unique for the time in how they didn't exactly go high fantasy like Ronald McDonald trying to put an apple pie up Grimace's pee hole, but it wasn't the lifestyle ads most places go to now. It was basically urban fantasy. The king shows up somewhere, bees a creep, and then gives somebody food. The tone ping pongs back and forth between unnerving to funny to uncomfortable. This feels less like ads that would air on TV and more so parodies of ads, and that's kind of what they were going for. Everybody secretly hates mascots. Like, if you saw the Dorito Bandito get stabbed, I'm gonna check Twitter before I dial 911. So why not go so far past zero, it's a 10? Make a mascot so unsettling and creepy that it wraps back around to being beloved. Well, the problem is that at some point it needs to wrap back around, but it never became beloved, it just got creepier and creepier. Need I remind you that SpongeBob's can makes him lust like no good Christian boy should? In 2011, the character got shelved because women and children were scared of him. In all fairness, I think you don't need to stop at women and children. However, come 2015, the king popped back up in the most unexpected of places. As the corner man for Floyd Mayweather Jr. in his 20-minute cuddle puddle with Manny Pacquiao. Now, trust me, the sight of boxing rings makes my blood pressure rise, but it marked the return of the king. See, in the years since, marketing teams have discovered the winning formula that anything that existed at any point has a fan base that wants to see their thing back. The Noid? Sure! Bubsy? Get in here! The King? Buddy, we kept your seat warm. What's more is that most humor that companies go for is just what The King was doing all that time ago. Awkward, cringe humor ads were par for the course, if anything, and The King was finally home! It's not like Burger King didn't know how to make an intriguing ad. They brought back the subservient chicken and called him a slut before arresting him for buying booze for kids! What was this tangent about? Hey, kid. Hey. Ain't you that, uh, uh, Savitian chicken? No, no, it's, uh, slut, uh, you're a slutty chicken. You're a f mess, look at you. I don't know, man, what other background is there for Sneak King? The most infamous of the Burger King games was also the one that had the most development effort put into it. The team knew one game had to be the standout star of the pack, and this time, instead of an ensemble, you're squarely in the shoes of the king. Don't worry, though. Son of Wambo Jr. is closer than you think. The game is actually the only one to have undergone a bunch of design changes, seeing as originally it was meant to be a puzzle board game in the vein of Spy vs. Spy, where a bunch of kings would try to hunt down and brutally help a target with cheap fast food. However, Burger King slowly swaggered in and slid their plans off the table to give them a new one. And that plan was more so a series of rules that they had to follow under. Rule number one, there was to be no more than one king per game. Any more in the universe might collapse. Okay, well, how about a game where the non-union Mexican equivalent Mies on the Xbox fight over a crown to turn themselves into the king? I've heard of worse Faustian bargains. Well, no, because Burger King said that rule number two was that you couldn't have people turning into the king. Well, what if the king was trying to deliver food and the other players set traps for him? No, can't show the king in danger of being hurt. That's rule number three and... Hey, I got an idea! The game is all about the king sitting in a plain white room eating saltine crackers and drinking room temperature water! Is that a good idea?! Eventually, a stealth game was decided on because if Konami can't kill the franchise, what chance does the king have? To really capture the essence of the king, as in literally trapping it in the game like an ancient artifact, they even brought the king himself to the land of monarchy, England, in order to do some motion capture. For what, I don't know, his funny little dances, I guess. It seems like a bit of trouble to go through for the Burger King games, but like I said, they probably outsold your favorite Xbox game, so hard to say who the real winner is. The results of which open with another live action opening of the King stalking his latest victim before presenting them with Sneak King. 
You can just kill me. So hopping into the game, you get dropped into a sandbox filled with hungry people and challenges for you to do. Expecting a plot from this game is like expecting a horse to crap ice cream. There's something there, but it's not that. Instead of a set level structure, this game has challenges for you to do where you can sneak up on people and give them food. When you get up to them, you play a little timing mini game in order to see how much flourish you give your sneak. The more flourish, the better your score, and the better dance the king performs. Really putting that motion capture to good use. You can multiply these scores by getting closer to the victim, waiting until they're literally dying of hunger, or popping out of special hiding spots. These challengers are spread all across a massive open sandbox that has nothing to do in it except simply dole out croissant witches to unsuspecting mouth breathers but still predates Metal Gear Solid 5 by about eight years and has a more fulfilling story. <laughs> All of those challenges the game has you doing are the exact same sneak up that you'll be doing from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. You'll have different parameters like not getting caught or doing it so fast, but how you go about accomplishing that is made infinitely harder when the game and you aren't on speaking terms. Instead of being able to stealth around in peace, people's view cones are all out of whack in terms of what you think they see and what they actually see. Obviously, it's kind of hard to miss this corporate golem shambling from trash can to trash can, but even still, in a stealth game, there are two important things that you need to nail in terms of your enemies. Easily understandable visual cones and exploitable patterns. And this game fails at one of them, and wouldn't you know it, it fails at the other one too! People just wander aimlessly around these massive hubs, which also act as the levels themselves. In the challenges where you can't be seen, there are just brain-dead workers walking and waiting to spot the giant jewelry you wear and call you out, giving you a game over. Then when you finally get where you're going, there's no sure way to know the people you need to feed are even gonna be there. They may just wander off somewhere else, or worse, never have been there to begin with. The game just doles out who's hungry and who's not at what feels like total random, so the distance you have to travel is almost never conducive to actually getting there on time and getting a good grade. Yeah, pot calling the kettle black, giving me a C here, game. Because of this, you can be left completely strung out by the people that are so far away that by the time you get there, they're passed out dead from exhaustion and starvation, meaning that they're out of the running for the mission. Worse yet, getting spotted means that the victim you're stalking also loses their appetite. I don't blame them, honestly, but at the same time, I do blame them. Get back here, you're getting a Waparito and you're gonna like it! There are four distinct realms in the BK universe, those being a lumberyard, a city center, and returning favorite suburbia and construction site. What exists between these four places? The f***ing void. And across these four iconic locales, we get a whoppering one song to accompany all of them. Move over, Metal Gear Rising. I think we got a new best OST. Sadly, I don't really have much footage to accompany the discussion of those four vaunted planes of reality because... I think I got the idea. I know it's sacrilege to not 100% a game before talking about it, but come on, it's 80 missions of the exact same thing. Cut me some slack. <laughs> So what can you say about the actual games themselves? Obviously, yes, what you see is what you get. There's not like some life-changing moment in any of these games that's gonna change how we think about video games. They're budget games, made on a budget, sold at budget prices. Does that make them bad? Well, no, I think there's still some enjoyment to be squeezed out of these games, whether it be intentional with Pocket Bike Racer or ironic with the other two. Should you play these? God, no. Should you pick up all three of these games on eBay right now for $8? Yeah, duh. At the very least, you're gonna get some very interesting drink coasters. 